Here is our what day is it? Today's Tuesday, February thirteenth. Looking over, first of all, I want to look over the batch script that we used to sum numbers over a range. And suppose I want to do that batch script here. Let's just see what would I do. I wasn't sure where to get started. I know a little bit of DOS. I could go to Google, my friend Google, and just type DOS bat about summation. DOS bat summation for you. And see what shows up. Okay, calculating the sum of two variables in a bat script. Well, that's at least, at least getting me close. Sum of two variables. Let's see what that does for us. Okay, so I see here. I can take a variable a and b, and I can say c equals percent a percent plus percent b percent. And then I also see that set slash a does the math instead of building a string, which is what this does. I get that instead of what I intend to do math. So the slash a is the first thing we learn. Okay. But this is all well and good, but I want a loop that adds numbers across a range, like from 1 to 3, it would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 gives me 6. So, let's try a different keyword search. Let's try uh, summation batch EAT loop. Some numbers in a loop. Hmm, let's see what that does. And what do I get? There's a way to do the for loop. And we do a little bit of work on what is in the for, what this all means. I can do DOS help. Help me understand what, what goes there. So I just say help for. And I see, let's see here, slash r, hit the space. Oh look, slash L, and I can read this explanation of what the for slash L means. So there gives me my clue. Okay, I, I get a loop. Start, stop, end. So at this point, from what I know so far, I should be able to write something like this. And I Learn a little about some strange thing called enable delayed expansion. Uh, let's see, Nathan and Brett, you use this. Nathan, could you explain what enable delayed expansion? And Dan, I think you got that one. What is enable delayed expansion about? You it makes it work correctly. <laughs> it is confusing. It's like, wait a minute, why did why did that? Why was that? Right. Yep. Yep. Producible blind proof. Dan, you got a better explanation? Because you used it as well. All right. Let me let me try to explain it because it is useful just to understand a little bit more about DOS batch files. When I first think of you being the the compiler, that you're running the script. Think of you're that machine. And when you come down, you set this variable sum equals zero. Okay. But from now on, whenever I see the word sum, I'm going to put a zero there. So you come to this script, and you see, okay, this is going to be a loop. I'm going to set the variable x to be one. Start at one, and step. I don't think you got this right. So that's not quite right. But let's suppose I'm, this is going to be another number. Let's say we'll put a three there instead of this percent x. And then... And actually, uh, if I don't have a variable for, variable for x yet, I'm going to put a zero there. And I'll come to the word sum, and I'll see if I have percentage around that, like you did up here. Or if it doesn't do, if I have percentage around, I say, okay, sum is zero right now. I'll put a zero here because that's what I know sum to be. 
without delaying my checking what sum has in it. The first time through this loop, sum had the value zero in it. So I, I turn that into a zero right away. That's expanding the variable name, see what's in it, and I put a zero there. And for then on, the entire time through the loop, I, I always have a zero there instead of what's in the variable sum because the first time, non-delayed expansion, I saw, oh, sum has a zero. So I'll change this command to be set a sum equals zero plus whatever the variable x is there at that time through the loop. So every time I'm going to be saying sum equals zero plus one, zero plus two, zero plus three, and at the end my result will be three. The delayed expansion means, wait a minute, when I come and see some, see inside this loop, as I'm deciding what to do here, I won't decide until that time through the loop what I look inside of sum to see what goes here. Does that make any sense? And I'm waiting until I'm here to see what's inside of sum. Then sum will take on the value, and I don't have to put the parentheses there because that's assigning into that variable, but think of that as a local variable. Oh, now I'm going to see what's in it. Instead of when I start, I had a zero in it. I'll check again every time through the loop. So that's that's how scripts work. They and compilers have a similar thing where you call it it's a one or two pass compiler. When you're running or compiling your program, check to see what variables are going to have in them, and then come the second pass, and say, okay, while we're running, we know that this has to be treated special. Whereas if I had just some variable that said my name is Joe, and every time I see the word uh, name per percent name percent, I put Joe there. Well, that doesn't matter because Joe is not changing throughout my program. But if a variable does change, I have to enable delayed expansion, and then that just tells it, hey, check on the current value of sum. Don't just use what it was when I read through the script the first time. Now, this doesn't do the check that a variable is a number. And I like, uh, let's see, I think some of you have that that solution. Let's just take a look at it. And pop it up real quick. And there's, there wasn't just one answer. And remember the key to that too. Let's just do the search for that here as well. Let's just do for keyword search DOS bat validate uh, number. There we go. I can check that it's numeric. And let's see what answer this guy gave. Several answers here. There was a simple one here. Here we go. Here's one way to check it. Just say, treat it, when I do the slash A, remember slash A means treat it as a mathematical. So if I do set slash A, assign to this variable bar check, Whatever they put in a particular variable, this could be percent one for my first parameter, percent two instead of percent bar, and then just to check, hey, if what I set it to be mathematically is equal to what they typed in, then I know that they gave me a valid number. And in this case, we do a go to in parentheses. We'll jump to here. Otherwise, it will exit, meaning leave the program and uh, make them start over. Notice in the if-else format in DOS, I put parentheses around the thing I want to do in the true part, and after the else, parentheses around that, even though I'm only doing one thing. So this is a handy way just to check if that's a number, when I convert it to math, I will get the same thing. If this were not a number, and it can't convert it, bar check, I think either would have a zero or a negative one. I don't remember what it comes out to be. If it can't convert it correctly, I think zero is what it turns out to be. If it can't convert it correctly. So, I, easy way to check. If, if this can be converted to math, then what they type will be equal to what it is when I convert it to math. And that's a way to check. Now, What's missing from here that I obsess about in DOS bat files? 
Well, I guess he does have comments down here. It would be useful to have a comment here because this is always clear. You might put a comment here of convert to a number, verify that it matches what they type. That's a simple way to check for a valid number. So some kind of a comment here checking in, just uh, put, telling the person reading the script, here is where I'm checking that bar is a valid number. Okay, little exercise for you then. Write me a batch script using this kind of thing that checks whether they've entered uh, three valid numbers. And go ahead and put the, put the valid numbers as parameters one, two, and three. So I'll put it up right, put it right here. Put in comments. Check that first three parameters are not. What would that script look like? And you don't need a loop here for this one. Pause the recording. Michael, you got to do this. Okay, checking parameter one. Remember the code that we did, and this time I'm, I, I read through that comment at, at uh, Stack Overflow, and now I try to do it from memory. Set slash A mathematically, and I'll just call it percent B, sorry, B equals percent one. That will Try to get the numeric value of that first parameter into B. If, now I have to look at the value that's in B, percent B, that means read what's in B, and compare it to what's given to me in parameter 1. If they both convert to the same thing, if I mathematically convert, if I typed in a 2 and mathematically converts to a 2, B and 1 will have the same value. And so then what I'll do is, I'll take parameter 1 is valid. Exclamation point. Else, parentheses, oh, I forgot, forgot to say echo. And I can put this on separate lines too, just to make it more readable. Else, echo not not a valid integer. Let's just test for that first one. Then I'll worry about whether I have the right for the other. Save this as a batch script underneath my CS230 documents. Put it in the right place so I can fill up my disks. There it is. I'm going to call it valid val nums. Got that. And all I'm going to do is worry about checking the first one, and then I can just duplicate my code for it. Now, Dan, you did more elaborately. I love that you actually do the loop. That's great. Even more practice. And I think, and I think there were other variations that, uh, as long as you got the answer, those doesn't necessarily look the same. So let's right, make sure I'm in the right place. There's my val nums. So I just run val nums. Got that. Now, if you give it my parameters, right now, I don't even know if I have parameters. Let's go to give it A, B, C. Well, really, all it cares right now is what parameter one is. Let's see what happens. Uh oh, I messed up. What did I do wrong? Anything else?
Okay, having it on the same line uh, is what made the difference. I didn't realize that that would be a problem, not having it on the same line. And of course, I don't want it to echo the if statement, so I come back to the top here, and I do a echo off, so I only see the message, I don't see it executing the message. And now, See how A is not valid? It's giving me the right message, and let's make sure I test it with a natural number there. It is a valid integer. Actually, it should be. It is a number. How about I say that? It is a number. I'm going to try one thing here. I try this. Maybe I have to have the do if I'm doing multiple lines. I, I was trying to do it this way to make it look more readable. I thought this would work. I thought I had it working in another batch. Yeah, it does take that. So I like this format just because it's more like how I do if else in other programming languages. Now that I know it's working for the first one, I can do a brute force. Well, let's just now copy this a few times and change it from the one. CD. CD change. So now, now that I figured out how to validate one parameter at a time, figured it for the dollar one, I can do it for dollar two as well. But you see here, I'm checking each parameter. Oh, and this, sorry, this is dollar. That's the third parameter. So this is just a little practice at checking parameters. Now let's give it some parameters. Let's do 11, 12, and then Z. And I should say 11 is number, 12 is number, Z is not valid or not a number. Okay, so that was just, just a little practice more at doing that, just because uh, on that homework, it was, wasn't was quite done right. Now, there, there was the other part about looping until they got the right answer. I'm not going to go over that, but if you uh, want to see that, I can... Uh, Maybe I'll post. Maybe I'll post the answer on screen because we want to get on to something more exciting uh, before we leave batch scripts. Though remember, we want to not only be good at DOS bat, but the next thing coming along. Remember what the next thing coming along is? The PowerShell. The PowerShell is what the future versions of Windows are going to be more and more using. I don't know if they'll ever give up DOS because there's just such a huge amount of batch files out there. But knowing to use the PowerShell will be, and I like the PowerShell with the ISE because I can write PowerShell scripts up here and then execute them by just clicking the run button and it'll show me my output. So this is, let's just write a very simple PowerShell script by starting the PowerShell ISE. And that's getting found under just the Windows button. You start typing PowerShell. And you know, so you have the PowerShell all by itself or with an integrated environment that gives you the PowerShell and more. I don't know what just happened to the projector. Let's go up. Got a blink at the top. So PowerShell with ISE. And let's see what I can do. Let's just do something simple. Echo. Hello. 
from a PowerShell script. I can use the same DOS commands that are available in uh, in DOS as in PowerShell. So if I run this, I see, oh, look at that kind of output. I get a separate line per, per uh, string on that line. And let's go back and edit that. Back here. Let's go ahead and go ahead and save that as a script. I'm going to save that as, save it at my same location where I was saving the other ones. In my D drive documents. And I'll call this hello.ps1. And if I don't type the suffix, it will automatically put the suffix name into my shell, ps1. And with this ID, let's run it again here. This time, let's put this in quotes. See if it'll be a little better. Yeah. And there is a way to actually see the file at the same time. In your view, you can adjust, you can show the script pane, and I think you can even have them be distributed. There we go. I can show my script pane on top while I actually run it down here. And there, see how putting it in, see how Echo is not quite the same in PowerShell as the echo is in DOS, but they most of them behave similar. Let's let's see if the echo slash question mark gives me different parameters than in DOS or the help method. There we go. Oh look at this. In DOS Echo is actually doing a command called write output. It's actually an alias to the write output command. And notice over here, I have all my commands available to me listed over here. So in PowerShell, I have many commands and, they, and in the ISE, built-in help right over here on the right. Just because there's so many commands, I'm going to need a little more help. So instead of using echo, let's do the right output. Right? Dash. Oh, look at that. It has help. Auto-complete in the ISE. I think if I hit tab, yeah, tab will use that command that pops up. And then, hello, again. Without quotes, save it, run it. I see my output with the right output, unless I put it in quotes, it puts each word on a separate line. Now, let's see if there's parameters to hello to right output that will keep it from getting a new line each time. So let's do, uh, let's go down to read the help for right output. Go down to W over here. I think I could even just start typing in here, right? I only have to scroll down to the W, to the out, w that I can just see right output. I click on it, and look at that. I can actually build the right output command. Let's try this. Hello again. And let's see, let's try, let's see what happens if I do no enumerate. Insert. There is, oh, look at that. There's how I could write that message. Hello again. And let's see what happens if I hit enter. Ooh, ugliness. Well, maybe, let me put that in quotes then and make, make these happen. So, right output the way that it builds for me. Let's do an insert. Now let's see if it runs. Okay. So right output apparently is expecting more than just things. There has something to do with objects. So the PowerShell variables are treated more like objects, like it's more like a programming language. It's, I'd say, yeah, it's, it's much more complex than DOS. Going to take a while to get used to building PowerShell scripts, and that's where we're going to be in the system at, or uh, advanced Windows and, and systems admin. We get a little deeper into PowerShell scripts.
But for now, you could consider anything that you could do in a DOS script, I think should run equivalently under PowerShell, but we won't know until you actually test it. So PowerShell scripting is where the world is going for uh, building scripts uh, that can do some powerful multiple tasks at once. Let's just do one just for fun here. And if you need to, we can uh, we can use a, a little help. Let's see if we can write a loop that simply uh, counts to 10. I'm going to fix this one. And let's see, is there a way to count to 10, just write the numbers from 1 to 10 in the PowerShell? Now, coming over here, I can always go underneath the loop. See if there's any help there. Well, there's no loop. How about the 4? There is a 4 each object. There's a four each. How about is there a while? I don't while. Four. Hmm. Not sure I want that. That sounds kind of I just, I'm going to go online and search for a four loop. In PowerShell, just because I haven't found something quick here, let's see how quick I can find an answer. To just a simple counting, try this counting loop PowerShell. Sometimes you get some fancier ones. Here, oh, look at this. There's a four. Oh, that's starting to look like a Java-like language. Let's try this format because I've seen this before. I'm going to copy and paste this. Put it in my script here. Change this from active campaigns to a 10. Let's see what this does. Now, do I need curly braces? Let's see how they give their example again over here. Oh, yes, they do have curly braces. Very again, looking a lot more like Java. And I like curly braces there. And let's try a, instead of an echo, let's try a right output. Uh, it looks like instead of percents, I need to use dollar. Let's try dollar i. And then end my curly brace. Let's see what happens if this will indeed do a loop. And I forgot to save it. I can just have it, yeah, save it every time before I run it. And if I look at my output, look at there, it counted from 1 to 10. So I'm a little disappointed. Over here, underneath the help over here, I don't see help on the 4 coming. Maybe I have to search a little bit more. Let's try again. I'll just do a search for 4. PowerShell for loop, and I'm going to look for a Microsoft page because they usually will give me a whole list of PowerShell. And not getting there's a blog Microsoft, finally TechNet Microsoft way down here. And another blog, oh, Udemy, they, that might be pretty good. PowerShell, here we go, technical article, Social TechNet Microsoft. Let's see what they offer. Although it's going to be likely harder to read, uh, I, it's a more authoritative answer. Let's see, they give me, here's an example of a for loop in the PowerShell. So use your searching skills, check what the source is, and get, get used to reading Microsoft documentation. And 
here I think it's not too hard, except they don't explain a whole lot, do they? They just say, here's an example of a very short loop. I do a right, oh, but they're doing a right post instead of writing out. But they're writing dollar $i. Very common to use i as my variable in for loops. So PowerShell is scripting counting from 1 to 10. Now, let's see. Can I get it to, to appear on one line instead of uh, instead of a separate line? Let's see. Let's do their parameters to write output. So for write. There it is. Let's give me the help. No enumerate. Uh, how do I get it to not text in a loop? I think there's a way to tell. I don't think no enumerate is on one line. Let's try a. Get rid of that command back to base so control C. I think it will. Uh, let's try help, right? Get help right out. Get. Get help right out. And. Oh, that's it. Hard to read stuff here. Let's see if I get anything useful. All I want to figure out is there a way to not just type a new one? They do have this thing, common parameters. Try one more thing. They did say try the try the right output, help right output minus full. Or I have to try minus examples. I thought I could quick find an answer of not giving me a new line each time. Suppressing enumeration, I don't think is it. So coming back to here, can you think of a way to not have the output appear on a new line each time? A little, this a little bit of a critical thinking skill now. How could I have my numbers all appear on one line instead of each time starting on a, a new line. Have the, have, the, have the numbers count out all on one line. How could I change something to have them print out all on one line instead of one line at a time? I was, I was looking for, can I just get right out but not to send out a new line? I haven't seen figure out how to do that yet. I think there'd be like no new line or minus n or something. What do you think? In parentheses? Give it a try. I did a quick search for right output, no new line, and I found someone that says try this, minus no new line. Well, that did do it. Bad answer from Stack Overflow. Now, I saw someone say right post might have that. Try right post. There we go. Right.
right host does take the no new line parameter, not right output. Is that what you did, Nathan? Right host takes no new line, and now if I run it, I get them appearing on one. And let's go ahead and put spaces in between. I think the plus means concatenate or find out. Oh, and I don't need to have the plus there. I just write it out, and they run it. I think I could just put dollar i inside of parentheses with a space after it. I think that would Now, I had a different answer. I thought, well, if I can't figure out how to do a new line, here's something else I could have done. Let's just try, remember that delayed expansion thing? Let's try this. Before we start our loop, let's just say line equals an empty line. And let's try line plus equals dollar i and a space. And then at the end, do a right output uh, line. You think that'll work? Let's find out. Oh. oh, it did work. Because here I want to start a new line. Let's just do a right output. And now, here was another possible answer. If I couldn't figure out, oops, my guy, say right out that I can't find, I find, find something. Oh, maybe it has to have something there. You can't just say right out without telling it what's right. Stopping it and running it again. There we go. So here was another solution. If I didn't know how to start a new line, or to tell it not start a new line, I could have given up and said, okay, rather than try to figure out how to send it out without a new line, build up a, a variable, and then after the loop is done, write that variable out. So here's another answer. If I couldn't figure out how to get this guy to not give me a new line, say, okay, don't generate the output inside the loop, build a string, and then send the output. And actually, I was trying to do this in DOS back, and I could not get string variables to build up inside of a loop. That just, this morning, I just could not get that to work. So, I'm liking PowerShell already in the scripting part. It's much more like a programming type language, and the horrendous go-tos I don't think are present in PowerShell. Real programmers don't like go-tos. Yeah, but, but it works, and you can see how, oh, you got to follow. Okay, if I go to here, but then if I go to here instead, and you can see how go to can get really crazy. Yeah. So this will make you, by learning PowerShell scripting, you'll actually learn other, pro you're learning other programming languages without even knowing it, because other programming languages do it like this. JavaScript, Java, C, C++, many of them use very similar syntax. And the only thing confusing is if there's just tiny differences between two, those will annoy you. But you're further down the road if you're learning PowerShell scripting, you're more similar to other industrial strength programming languages. But there is a place for DOS batch files because it's been around for so long. Thousands of DOS batch files are out there. So if you're working with Windows and you need to do something like I want to process a thousand files, there's probably a batch script ready to go for you. All you need to do is be able to read it, maybe modify it to, to work for your script. So be able to read those online helps. So over here, what I did here, wasn't sure how to do this. I just did a search for write, output, no new line, and right away, stack overflow. I had to read through a few attempts and finally found out, oh, right host instead of right output. Okay, now something completely different. You're working on a system, and maybe there's a batch script we could do this with if we figure this out, but first let's do it manually. What we want to do is add a printer. 
how in the world can we add a printer to our system? So our task, our new task is, I had a presentation, we'll just put it in a notepad here. We have a job to add a printer. Add a printer. What do you mean, add a printer? Why is in my font? I thought I could increase my font size. Okay, plus plus. Is that readable enough for you? Well, how do I add a printer? Where would you go first to guess where you might add a printer? And what do you mean, add a printer? Do I make a printer that's on the network somewhere, I want to be able to print to it. And let's just take a look at what this printer did add or print over here. Suppose we didn't know about this printer. I had to come over to this printer and uh, go to the menu. And that's here. I put information there. Trying to print something out. Got that. So that's what I need to know about my printer. Network printer. I need to know my network address. 10.128.10.20. Now, in order to set up this printer, you, of course, need to be administrator in your machine. Now, you can uh, do this on your uh, VMware machine. Go ahead and fire that up if you're not already in there. If you need to be on a machine, you have administrative privileges on. And if you break something, you haven't broken the printing for anyone using this computer. So fire up your, your, uh, your own Windows machine, because we want to do this as administrator on your machine. And we'll see... If you're not bridged, whether you can make it work. Even if it's if it's not bridged, you should be able to do the setup, but you may not actually be able to print it. But that's not a problem. We just want to verify that we can actually just talk to the print without even worrying about printing. Okay, so is your uh, system fired up? And your administrator, go to your control panel then. And bring up your control panel.
Well, let's find out. We may have an issue here. I'm going to try it from mine here, and because uh, I'm not sure of the settings here, I'm going to pretend it's a whole new printer. Okay, so here's the first piece of information I have is the network address, and that's that's more typical. It used to be uh, that I'd have a printer that was directly connected to this machine as a USB printer, and I want to share it to the world. Well, we can take a look at that. But typically, there's a network printer out there that I can connect to, and then actually I can share it to the world. So all the people need to know is my PC's address that I'm already done a little, slightly more difficult part of connecting to the printer. But let's just see what it takes to connect. All I know right now is it's a printer at a certain at this particular address. If my PC doesn't automatically detect the vendor, I'm going to have to figure out the uh, actual model. But let's try it without needing, without knowing the model yet. So there's my address. And if you can guess, we go to the control panel. Uh, but I can use my Windows X key to take me to. Oh, they're not printing there. So I guess I can just go to the, the system or settings. Let's try. Let's try. Oh, there we go. Settings. Settings takes me to the control panel. Now here's my new control panel. I got to get used to this thing. I wish I could get my small icons back, but they're moving us into this settings. And it's not horrible. I can find. Let's see, where's my devices? Yeah. And there's my printers and scanners. And this, I think, will take me to the classic printer and scanner page. Oh, no, it's not quite the classic page. Now, at this point, I'm going to pretend that I don't have the printer yet. I think this is the, is this the one, the latest at 400. I could actually delete that and start over. But I'm going to just add that as though I'm adding a new printer. So add a printer or a scanner. And by default, it searches. This is the... Uh, the way it helps, it used to be I could cancel the search. Let's go ahead and see if I can just click here right away and cancel it from scanning. Let's see if I can just go right here to the printer that I would want is listed. Good. I can click right away and add it manually. Because I want you to know how this is done. This is often you won't be able to see the printer out there, and you just have to add it just based on your IP address. And fortunately, in this Add Printer dialog, I can pop right down to Add Printer using the TCP IP address there. Click on that and click Next. And now, all I need to do is type in its IP address. After, what was it, 10, 128, 220? Back to that dialog. Now what's happening here is it will actually create a device, a, a network port for me on my computer to that specific address. It's showing you the name it's going to give that port. And we're going to see if our computer can actually find out what type of printer it is just based on if there really is a printer out of that address. If this doesn't work, if the auto detect doesn't work, I can go manually go hunt for the drive of that thing. And we'll go through that just so you know you can do that if you need to. Everybody, good? everybody caught up with me here? Good? What was it, uh, did do an update or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you restart it and then just do switch user, or did you actually shut down your machine at that point? Oh, okay. And and you're welcome to leave your machine, your virtual machine running. If you're logged in as your separate user, if you do a control switch user, 
uh, students will be able to use that machine, and your virtual machine can still be there and run any updates that it might have. And unless we see that your machine that you're on is running super slow because of that, don't worry about leaving that running. You're, you're, these machines are easy enough where if you're not doing a huge comp compile or something, you're not going to be slowing down that PC or bit enough. So you can watch for now, and then when yours is up, we'll walk you through this. So you enter the host name and then click next. And let's see if I can figure out. Oh, look at that. It's detected that the driver is already installed. I wish it would tell me what it is. I guess I'll go with this and let and see what it found out about that. I was hoping it would say, oh, I know this, this kind of machine. I'll go ahead and, at this point, go with the driver. If this was the first time I were ever connecting to this particular model printer, I'm thinking it would do the install and go online to find it. We're looking pretty good about that. Yep. Oh, way to go. So you did install the driver. Good. And look at that. It, it thinks it's a laser college at 3800 PCL6. Now, this would be a bad thing to just check to make sure that that indeed is what it is. It needed someone that could put the IP address on it. And there I see it's 3800 and color. Go on home. Yeah, so it found out what type of printer it was. And now I click next. And at this point, because it's a network printer, my PC automatically, or Windows 10 automatically tries to be a good citizen on the network and share this printer with others. This is the same thing that Apple iOS does, uh, that when it sees a printer, it runs a program called Bonjour that shares everything that it has. And if you browse a network where there's Macs on them, you'll see Bonjour being sh sharing lots of things. Sometimes that's not a good thing, like it will share your entire music collection to the the world. If you just see, browse your student network, you will see interesting shares out there. People probably don't even know that their computer is suddenly sharing lots of things. So, just to be nice, I'm going to put a location. Smith Classroom. Your classroom. And I will often add the comment, please, no printing during class sessions. Just because it gets annoying, but noisy to those poor students sitting on this end of the room. Unless, of course, the instructor says, okay, let's practice print. Now I click next. And let's try, well, let's see, if I print a test space, I know we're running out of toner. I probably should check the room that that room may have some. But I'm going to uh, forego the printing a test. Actually, I'm going to do just to see it in the queue. And then I'll. Uh, I'll just assume that it works. But before I do the print test page, I'm going to go back to my settings. I want to see what's in my control panel. In camera, I can go to the Windows X settings. And let's see printers and scanners. And it should see a copy one. It said it was making a copy one. There it is. Copy one of that printer. Let's go ahead and double click on it. Open queue. Here I can see what this computer is ready to send to that printer. Remember my computer has a queue. This is not the queue at the printer, internal to the printer. This is my queue on my computer. So watch what happens if I click print test page. I think I should see a document quickly appear in the queue and then disappear. Let's see what happens. Yep. It appears. It's being sent to the printer. I'm going to close this. And if all is well, that should go away unless something's wrong with the printer, like it's not talking to me or its queue is full or it's not printing. This should quickly go away. And I will then finish my setup of that printer. So the steps that I went through, add a printer, 
by IP address. I like that. Uh, you can, you know, it's not as hard to just let it search for it. I want you, I want you to see what it would take. Suppose it would, it uh, did not recognize it. How you could add it? All you knew was its IP address. And of course, it better if you want it to recognize it. It needs to be on and connected. Now you see what's going on here. It's showing me out of paper. I can right click on this and cancel that particular job. Now, if you're working in a in a company that they have lots of printers, what do you think the problem could happen if I have if I have a printer out there on the network?
some of the system level configuration. The printer, configuring our printer is pretty basic. Uh, we'll add more uh, next time. Uh, and we want to make sure, I've given you a little extra time, making sure you have documented your installation. I want you to be comfortable, comfortable enough, enough with your documentation that from your documentation you can quickly get another system installed. which will be a a project we'll be doing on Thursday. So make sure your Windows installation documentation is clear so that if you strictly follow that, you have enough information there to, to give a, a complete working installation. And I'm, saying, I'm thinking we'll, we'll see if we can find a Windows 7 version just to give you a taste of working with Windows 7. There's a lot of them still around.